The year 1998 has made its debut with Eastern Canada in a state of emergency as a result of the worst ice storm in history. Many parts of Quebec, Eastern Ontario and the Maritimes looked like a war zone. Eerie landscapes of twisted hydroelectric towers and crumpled trees gave the impression that large parts of Canada had been in the direct path of a hurricane. Thick chunks of ice falling from buildings made the streets of Montreal unsafe for pedestrians. Millions of people were without electricity for weeks. The elderly had to cope with the severe Canadian winter as they shivered in unheated buildings. Many families left their homes and crowded into shelters to keep warm. The army provided soldiers to help in the cleanup operation and help maintain order. Western Canadians rallied to assist with equipment and manpower. Back in August 1997, a San Diego newspaper warned, tough weather ahead. Readers were told of a new El Nino brewing in the Pacific. The December issue of Reader's Digest warned us that we would be facing the single most disruptive climatic influence on the planet. Is Canada feeling the results of the global warming we've heard so much about? Is this the El Nino phenomenon that has been so prominent in the news? It is written. This is Henry Fire Robin presenting as the answer to your deepest needs, the living Christ. Today our subject is El Nino. Every so often we begin to witness astounding new phenomena in nature and add new words to our vocabulary. Scientists are now using terms that we hadn't heard about too many years ago Words like global warming, greenhouse gases, bathtub effects, upwellings, thermoclines, cold tongues, warm pools, El Ninos and Las Ninas. A warm pool is a large patch of surface water almost 5,000 miles long in the tropical Pacific Ocean, and it seems to be defying the normal pattern. As one scientist recently said, these warm pools are marching to a different drummer disrupting the normal patterns of the life of countless species of plants and animals, along with hundreds of millions of human beings. Though they may bring periods of balmy weather to the western prairies in the middle of winter, El Nino causes climate abnormalities around the world. Some parts of the world have to prepare for heavy rains and floods. Others face impending drought, poor crop yields and starvation, Disrupted fish migrations and damage to coral reefs hinder those dependent on marine ecosystems for their livelihood. Some parts of the world are hit with catastrophes causing thousands of deaths. Christians who have been studying the prophecies should not be taken by surprise. Jesus said, and there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Luke 21, 25, and 26. The sea and the waves roaring, the powers of the heaven shaken, that sounds strangely familiar in the light of what is happening this winter. Now, I don't claim to be a scientist or even the son of a scientist, but fortunately, some of our scientists use illustrations helping us to understand the phenomenon. One scientist stated, the oceans and the atmosphere carry on a continuous dialogue. Each listens to what the other is saying and responds. Up to now, we have eavesdropped on one side of that conversation, how the winds along the equator influence the slope of the thermocline and the intensity of the upwelling. But the resulting changes in sea surface temperature will in turn have an effect on the winds. The twists and turns 
in the ongoing dialogue between ocean and atmosphere in the Pacific can have a ripple effect on climatic conditions in far-flung regions of the globe. A recent conference on global warming has brought to our attention that something is happening with Earth's climate. There's a deadly taint in the air that is threatening the climate of the world. Scientists call it greenhouse gases. We've been destroying our Earth and can see in the broken face of nature that a great wrong has been done. In Revelation 7, John saw four angels standing on the four corners of the Earth, holding the four winds of the Earth, Revelation 7, 1. Now, though I believe that this is a symbol of deeper spiritual meanings, I also believe that we are being protected by God's restraining spirit and that when God withdraws his power and bids his angels loose the winds, we will see the most violent storms in history. In Genesis 8, verse 22, God made a promise to the human race. Here's what he said. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, Day and night shall not cease, Genesis 8, 22. The march of the season imports a rhythm to our life on earth. Our climate changes swing like a pendulum between summer and winter. You can count on it. In order to survive, the human race has learned to adapt to the changing seasons. Year after year, our activities are planned around the seasons that follow a predictable pattern. Farmers plant the seed in the springtime and prepare for the harvest in the autumn. They know the best time to breed livestock. They know when to make hay and store it for the winter season. Fishermen know when to deploy their fishing vessels. Hunters know when to program their expeditions. Construction projects, military campaigns, and school vacations are planned around a well-defined series of calendar dates. Hotels have off-season rates. Merchants have seasonal sales of winter or summer clothing, umbrellas, swimwear, recreational equipment. Knowing that seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. God says, while the earth remaineth. Hidden in the depths of this promise, we hear ominous rumblings, harbingers of peril, innuendos of catastrophe. While the earth remaineth implies that it will not remain forever. An appointed time is coming when the seasons will melt into eternity, when there will be no night in God's kingdom. The time is coming when the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Second Peter 3.10 Century after century, everything seems to be following the same pattern. Men are saying, but since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation, 2 Peter 3, 4. Wherever people have heard the gospel story, December is a special time. It's the time when much of the world remembers the birth of the Christ child. In many parts of the world, the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6 is read. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 6. I've heard this passage read in different languages in different parts of the world. There's a special pathos in the Latin languages spoken in South America and Europe. A child is born. El Nino Naceo. And even though the seasons are reversed, even though palm trees replace our evergreens and lush green jungles cover the earth instead of our usual snow, it's a time for family and friends, a time for warmth and love. Along the western coast of South America, the coasts of Peru and Ecuador, the largest fishery of the world existed not too many years ago. Anchovies, sardines dominated it. This area provided one-twelfth of all the world's landing of fish by weight. The Peruvians are deeply religious. How appropriate that every year at Christmas time, the fisherman was forced to take a break. A warm ocean current would appear at times lasting for several months. The fish disappeared, fleeing to the cooler waters. 
This was the time to mend their nets, repair their equipment, and spend time with families and relatives. The warm ocean current seemed to them to be connected with the Christ child, and so they named it El Nino. Some years this current was exceptionally warm, causing the break in their fishing season to persist into May or June. Then, in 1972, El Nino was so powerful that the supplies of fish dropped in astonishing numbers. Two years later, an even stronger El Nino caused the fish stocks to fall below the level in which they could reproduce themselves. Permanent, irrevocable damage was inflicted on their fishing industry. In 1975, their fisheries minister declared a moratorium on fishing. No longer did El Nino seem so benign. Few Canadians, if any, became over-concerned about what was happening in faraway Peru. Most of us had never even heard of a phenomenon called El Nino. Even scientists did not realize that this was not just a local Peruvian occurrence, but was associated with changes over the entire tropical Pacific and would soon be felt around the globe. How can a warm pool in the Pacific control the weather conditions in the whole planet? Above the warm water, moist air rises, lowering atmospheric pressure. Like a stone in the middle of a stream, these rising vapors redirect the trade winds. There's still a great deal of mystery connected with the phenomenon. One scientist said, In considering problems in weather and climate prediction, it is vital to recognize that weather is governed by chaotic dynamics so that small differences in initial stages, the flap of a butterfly's wings, in the words of Edward Lorenz, can eventually lead to large differences in the atmosphere's behavior. There have been six El Ninos since 1970. The strongest and most devastating manifestation of El Nino in the century came in 1982 and 83, causing the greatest climate changes in recorded history. Scientists called it a maverick El Nino. The El Nino of 1982-83 produced weather-related disasters on almost every continent. Australia, Africa, Indonesia, and Brazil suffered drought, droughts, dust storms, and brush fires. Dry conditions in Australia resulted in a $2 billion loss in crops, and millions of sheep and cattle perished because of a lack of water. Peru was hit with the heaviest rainfall in history, 11 feet in areas where six inches was the norm. Some rivers carried a thousand times their normal flow. Streets turned into rivers, and the seaside town of Chuliaki was washed into the Pacific. El Nino was responsible for some 2,000 deaths and more than $13 billion in damage to properties and livelihoods. There were also secondary problems caused by the 1982-83 El Nino. Encephalitis outbreaks on the east coast of the United States attributed to a warm, wet spring perfect for mosquitoes. Increased snake bites in Montana as the hot, dry weather drove mice from high elevations downward in search of food and water, and the rattlesnakes followed. A rise in bubonic plague in New Mexico with a cool, wet spring providing favorable conditions for flea-ridden rodents. An increase of shark attacks off the Oregon coast due to unseasonably warm sea temperatures. And a rash of spine injuries in California as weather altered coastal seafloors fooled surfers. Some meteorologists have tied the El Nino to above normal temperatures recorded in Alaska and northwestern Canada, and a reduction in the salmon harvest. The warm water allows unusual species to migrate into our waters that do not normally belong here. In 1982-83 and 91-92, mackerel ranged farther north than usual. These are voracious feeders and prey on juvenile salmon. The effect was very large. Mackerel caught in Barclay Sound during these years were discovered to have six to eight juvenile salmon in their stomach contents. Abnormal wind patterns steered typhoons off of their usual tracks to islands such as Hawaii and Tahiti, which are unaccustomed to such severe weather. 
They also caused the monsoon rains to fall over the central Pacific instead of on the western side, which led to droughts and disasters, forest fires in Indonesia and Australia, winter storms battered Southern California and caused widespread flooding across the northern United States, while northern ski resort owners complained of an unusually mild winter and a lack of snow. While the El Nino brings about a decline in the hurricane activities of the Atlantic, great storms called pineapple storms cross the Pacific from Hawaii to the United States. Two scientists, David Salstein and Richard Roston of Atmospheric and Environmental Research Incorporated in Cambridge, Massachusetts, discovered that during the 1982-83 El Nino, it was noted that the eastward motion of the atmosphere due to weaker trade winds caused the Earth's rotation to slow measurably, increasing the length of a day by almost one millisecond. On May 28, 1997, CBS carried a peculiar headline, A Swarm of Squid Could Mean the Return of El Nino. It continued with this story from Newport Beach. It said, local fishermen this week reported their biggest haul of squid since 1990, and that could mean El Nino is back. Kelly Boone, captain of the sport fishing boat Nautilus, said, the squid came to us like a freight train. All you had to do was drop a jig about five feet deep into the water, and they would grab it. The squid, measuring up to two and a half feet long, are feeding on the sardines and smelt and sari that also follow the warm currents. On August 27, another headline announced, El Nino, possibly the strongest ever. World climate experts say that the El Nino weather phenomenon brewing in the Pacific could become the biggest climate event in the century, possibly causing a number of weather-related disasters. By September 16, reporters were saying that according to the new evidence, this coming storm could be one of the most dramatic events of the century. As November came, we were already reading of severe casualties. A CBS report said, flooding and mudslides caused by torrential rains in Ecuador have killed 27 people in the past three weeks. A mudslide Wednesday buried a house in the mountain village of Ariane. 80 miles southwest of Quito, killing 10 members of a road crew who had taken shelter in the building. What is the latest information? On December 18, 1997, an oceanographer named Bill Patzard told CBS News, this year's El Nino is definitely off scale to anything in recent times, including the 1983 El Nino. How amazing to see that a very small change of temperature, even a half a degree, can produce a significant change in the amount of tropical convection and has the potential to amplify the disruption of global climate far out of proportion to a seemingly small temperature change. Then there are the ripple effects. The forest fires due to El Nino these past few months in the Amazon and Indonesia are contributing strongly to the increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, as well as reducing the forest cover that absorbs carbon dioxide. This contributes to greenhouse warming. Over the past year, severe drought has plagued portions of the southern and western United States, with estimated agricultural losses in Texas alone reported at more than $1 billion. During the same period, much of the east has suffered from recurrent periods of heavy precipitation, at times bringing severe flooding. Some people have asked if it would be possible for scientists to control the weather patterns by artificially bringing about warm pools, heating up portions of the Pacific. What most of us don't realize is the tremendous volume of 5,000 miles of surface water. It's an area one and a half times the size of the United States. One of the most powerful devices humans have created is the hydrogen bomb. The power to produce the temperature change caused by El Nino would require 400,000 20 megaton hydrogen bombs. The bomb that destroyed Hiroshima was only 16 kilotons. We could use another illustration. A large power plant generating electricity for one of our big cities can generate about 1,000 megawatts. 
The El Nino related heating is equivalent to the total output of 1,400,000 such power plants working continuously for eight months. Only the Creator can control the forces of nature. The Bible says, The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea, and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Nahum 1, 3 to 5. The poet Cowper said, he plants his footsteps on the sea and rides upon the storm. An ancient Chinese proverb says, you cannot carve rotten wood. We know that there are some suits of clothing that aren't worth patching. During the Depression, people tried to cover patches with other patches. The Bible says that this world is simply worn out. It can't be patched up again. We read in the book of Isaiah, chapter 51 and verse 6, Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath, for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Isaiah 51, 6. The Bible tells us that there was singing at the time of the creation. Throughout time, nature has been singing God's praises. The air is filled with music, the solemn roll of the deep-toned thunder, the old ocean's ceaseless roar, the glad songs of the birds that make the forests alive with melody. Nature's 10,000 voices sing God's praises, but slowly the song of nature's changing. Dissonant chords mar the melodious harmony Nature's cheery descant is being replaced by mournful tunes in minor chords. The howl of the hurricane leveling entire city blocks and leaving thousands of homeless people in its wake. And even the ocean itself seems to be moaning and groaning. Paul says in the book of Romans, chapter 8, and verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together, until now. Soon God is going to exchange this old world for a new one. He promises in, in 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot, and blameless, 2 Peter 3, 13 and 14. I've always been amused by people who mispronounce words only slightly. A physician wrote about his trying to keep a straight face when a lady complained to him about her migrating headache and another about her mental pause or the old man who had trouble with his prospect gland. But there was a lesson in one of the errors after being told that his situation was serious, an old gentleman said to the doctor, Don't worry, my son has power of eternity. We can trust in the son who does have power of true eternity. He tells us that when we see the signs around us, we should not be afraid. He says, And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Luke twenty-one twenty-eight. There's an old story about a huge ship plowing through the seas in the dark of the night with its signal light blinking. The captain of the ship sees another light in the distance, and he blinks out an emergency message that says, Emergency! Collision inevitable! Change your course ten degrees to the south. The light in the distance blinks back an answer. Emergency! Collision inevitable! Change your course ten degrees to the north. The captain gets a bit hot under the collar, and he sends back the same message, adding, I am a captain, to which the light in the distance replies, Emergency, collision inevitable, change your course 10 degrees to the north. I am a third-class seaman. 
By now, the captain's furious. He sends back what he believes will be the clincher to the argument. Emergency, emergency, collision inevitable. Change your course 10 degrees to the south. I am a battleship. And the answer comes back from that blinking light in the distance. Emergency, collision inevitable. Change your course 10 degrees to the north. I am a lighthouse. We live in an unstable, changing world, but the lighthouse never moves or changes. It's always there for us. That beacon reaches us today across the waves, a message from Jesus, the light of the world. We have nothing to fear. The signs of Christ's coming are being fulfilled in rapid succession. We have all the evidence we need and more. The important thing for each of us is to be ready for his coming. Join me in prayer. Our Father, truly we are living in a grand and awful time. We thank you for the assurance that you have the power to control the forces of nature. We thank you for the lighthouse. May the sounds that surround us make us aware of the times in which we live. Bless each viewer now in the name of Jesus. Amen. What is happening to our weather? Wild weather patterns seem to indicate that something has gone wrong in our planet. Eastern Canada has just witnessed a disaster that has affected more Canadians than any other disaster in history. All around the world, strange things are happening to the weather. I'm convinced that global warming and the El Nino phenomenon are closely connected with Bible prophecy. And I've prepared a little booklet with the information that was on today's program. This booklet is yours for the asking. All you have to do is either call our toll-free number or write to It Is Written. Your copy will be on its way without cost or obligation. Now, here's the information that you need. As a convenience, you may request today's free gift offer by calling our Canadian National Toll-Free Number, 1-800-253-3000. Call right now, 1-800-253-3000. Or, if you prefer, you may request the offer by writing to It Is Written, Box 2010, Oshawa, Ontario, L1H 7V4. Once again, the time has come to say goodbye for another week. Mark and I look forward to being with you again next week at the same time. Until then, remember, It Is Written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God.